Okay, we're just starting our broadcast. Very good morning to you if you're in the uh, United States, the Caribbean, uh, or South America. Uh, good afternoon if you're in Europe uh, and the Middle East. And very good evening to you if you're joining us from the Asia Pacific uh, region. Uh, yeah, welcome to today's Crossing Borders broadcast, the IMC streaming service and that we created a few months ago to keep the investment migration uh, communities, professionals like yourselves, connected and informed uh, during the global lockdown. Uh, but in some places, continue on despite some of the borders opening again. If you haven't seen one of these broadcasts, uh, don't worry. Watch all of the previous programs on Catch Up through our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit like, share, and subscribe. <clears throat> uh, so, today's podcast is kindly sponsored by our partners IIUSA, uh, the National Trade Association for the EB5 Regional Center Program based in Washington, D.C. Remember, you can ask questions in the widget on the right hand side of your screen, uh, where you'll also find some useful information about the IMC training offer. There are quite a few uh, viewers with us today, and uh, we'd like to keep these sessions as interactive as possible. Uh, so do you can use the widget, make some comments, or interact with yourself and our uh, speakers, and we'll try and get through as many comments as possible. So, as, uh, as you saw, we'll have a, a little bit of polling to start us off. And what we're interested to know is where is everybody watching us from today? So, I'm going to launch a poll. You should see that on your screens. Um, and we'll give you uh, 10 seconds to answer. And once we get to 80%, uh, then we'll publish the results. Then we're at 73%. All right, I'm going to close the poll and let's share those results. Okay, so 50% from the Asian Pacific region uh, and then followed by Europe and the Americas with 25% each. Uh, and nobody from the Caribbean or Middle East with us today. All right, so that's uh, interesting uh, for us to know, of course. So during today's broadcast, we'll be discussing uh, EB5, the long-running employment-based uh, visa program for entering uh, and living in the United States. Uh, there are, of course, many various options uh, for living and working in the US, but today this is your chance to learn more about uh, what is a highly successful program uh, and hearing different updates from uh, the Industry Trade Association uh, but also from uh, industry specialists uh, that have been working in this space for uh, a good number of collective years uh, together. So without any further ado I want to introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Robert Kraft who's the Chief Executive uh, and Chairman of uh, FIRST Partners uh, and is also the chairman of IIUSA Invest in the United States, the trade association I mentioned uh, as our supporting partners. Uh, also, welcome, welcome to Christine Chen, who's the chief operating officer for Canam Enterprises in the United uh, Hogan, who's the president of the CMB Regional Centers, uh, and last but not least. Stephen Srinshaw, uh, who's the Chief Executive Officer uh, for the Cleveland International Fund uh, in the USA. Uh, so remember, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please put it on your control panel. So I'm going to uh, kick off straight away with, uh, with Bob. Uh, it's great to have you again, uh, on this program. Uh, for those viewers, uh, Bob, who are unfamiliar uh, with IRUSA, uh, can you explain the role uh, that I have to say, plays uh, nationally, but also uh, internationally, representing the industry. 
Yeah, thank you, Bruno. And uh, <clears throat> you're uh, breaking up just a little bit. I don't know if there's an adjustment or something or it's on my end, but uh, thank you for, for putting the webinar. We really appreciate it. Getting a lot of feedback. I don't know. If, uh, can you know yeah, I think you're breaking up a little bit, Bob, as well now. I think. Yes. All right. All right. All right. So, Bob, can you start again, please? What, um, what, what does you know IAUS evolve? Yeah, and hopefully this is coming through clearer than it sounds to me. But uh, first off, thank you, Bruno, for the relationship IUSA has with IMC and for putting together organizing this webinar. IUSA is the uh, trade organization, nonprofit organization in the United States representing the regional center uh, program, the EB-5 program with the government and with all the partners that participate in EB-5, uh, the attorneys, the developers, the regional centers, uh, and the list goes on and on. So we're a very diverse membership, but our primary focus is to advance uh, the EB-5 program, make sure that uh, changes made by the government uh, make sense and that the program is safe for investors from around the world. Uh, we also have membership overseas, so we really are more of an organ international organization than just a national organization. We spend a lot of time on education. We're the voice in uh, Washington, D.C., on the Hill and throughout the country with local representatives, and we advocate for best practices and to make sure that the program runs smoothly for our investors and they achieve what they want to achieve, which is uh, safe passage to the United States and return of their capital. So thank you for putting this together and we're honored to be affiliated with IMC. All right, thanks Paul. I, I, just staying a little bit with some of the work that you do in the United States. Uh, yesterday there was a House uh, Judicial Committee on Immigration and Citizenship uh, by the oversight uh, of the US um, Citizenship and Immigration Services. And, and the hearing included a panel um, with the Deputy Director of USCIS. Um, there was a representative from AMA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Um, but in advance of that hearing, um, my understanding is IIUSA submitted some uh, data for the official record. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about um, what was included in the uh, report that you submitted to the subcommittee, Bob? Well, thanks, Bruno. That, that's a really good example of what IUSA does. Uh, we have a, a full-time lobbying group, uh, and that was an opportunity for us to get on the record with Congress with respect to the impact uh, financially of the EB-5 program, not only in local communities, but uh, primarily this was focused on USCIS and their operations from a funding standpoint. Uh, EB-5 uh, fees uh, are significant in terms of supporting employees within that organization. And the EB-5 program is just part of many, many programs, but uh, the, the dollars that have been generated to help support the government activity to properly adjudicate and review uh, case files uh, is significant. So we were pleased to have a, a, the opportunity to submit on the record, a very extensive statistical report uh, that was very helpful from a congressional oversight standpoint. All right, good. Uh, so moving back to, to the EB-5 program uh, itself, can you run us through some of the changes that have taken place in the last uh, few months? Maybe back, um, let's you know, sort of backtrack a little bit to November uh, of last year, so what the effects um, have been on the EB-5 program? Well, the, the, the big change was uh, moving the minimum investment from 500,000 to 900,000. And all of us, and on this panel, you have probably four of the uh, leading regional centers in the United States. And I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues and I appreciate their time uh, participating in this panel. But uh, there was a lot of activity as people rushed to uh, save $400,000 to beat the deadline, and, and that was good for the industry. 
uh, and, and we had a strong finish to the year. Uh, now we've seen an adjustment uh, as people kind of get used to the new number, uh, and it certainly has slowed down a little bit. But I think part of that also is the COVID situation, people dealing with their own personal challenges in their home countries because the whole world has been affected by this. And because we can't travel, um, you know, it's going to be a totally different delivery method uh, from a communication standpoint, which takes a while to get used to. Uh, what we're doing today, uh, we weren't doing this type of thing a year ago. Uh, we were on airplanes, we were in front of groups of people visiting face to face around the world with investors. So that's had an effect, no doubt about it. And uh, uh, but the nine hundred thousand dollars was a big change. Uh, some of the uh, the other changes made IIUSA, the regulations that were put in place were intended to protect the investors, to tighten up uh, TEA. Uh, interpretation and to eliminate the gerrymandering that had happened in the past, which was one of the big issues that uh, Congress uh, had with the program. And IIUSA was very supportive of that change. So I think most of us uh, probably were operating close, if not within the regulation TEA, um, a new, a new requirement. So for us anyway, and I, I don't want to speak for the other people, but you know, it it, it it isn't an impact at all. We, we, we're pretty conservative on the way we structured our deals, uh, but that certainly had an impact on a number of regional centers. Not that they were doing anything wrong, but the the rules were looser and they were able to be ex creatively expanded, uh, you know, and good for them. I mean, it worked for a lot of people, but uh, uh, the new one is just something we all knew was coming and, and I think most everybody's adjusted to that. All right, thank you. And we know that, that there were particularly, uh, you know, a couple of senators very vociferous and very vocal on the jetty man uh, on the gerrymandering. Grassley was uh, was one of those. All right, thank you. Um, I, I'd like I, I, welcome Christine, Christine Chen. Um, I, you know, Chief Operating Officer, Panama Enterprises. We, you know, we know, we all know the change. You know, the world has changed tremendously in the last you know, five to six months. Uh, our lifestyles have changed, um, ideologies uh, have changed, business planning cycles uh, have changed. Uh, we're all adapting to, to these new norms, um, including how to make a decision about an immigration-based investment. So with the, with, the, with the changes that have taken place, Christine, can you run us through some of the basics of an EB-5 investment uh, as it is today? Um, sure. Um, I think that uh, the, the EB-5 program has always been an immigrant investor program predicated on jobs. Um, and I think that a lot of the uh, regulatory changes that uh, Bob mentioned and that you discussed have been really focused as the program has gotten more visibility over the past 10 years. It's it's really about how do we harness, how do we keep to the original congressional mandates of the program. Right. Um, so the the basic concept is that for each investor, his or her spouse, um, and their their dependents under the age of 21, that investment will create uh, 10 qualifying jobs. Um, while some in, in participate in and pursue it by visa have gone the direct investment route, which means you set up your own business or you acquire a business. By by uh, by, the vast majority of EB-5 investments are made through regional centers, um, such as the, those that all of us operate here. Um, that allows foreign investors to pool their investments um, into a larger project to meet those job creation requirements. Um, Typically, those uh, investments are made into a new commercial enterprise that, that then makes an investment into a job creating entity, commonly in the form of either a loan or an equity investment. Um, within a two year period, that investment must demonstrate that those qualifying jobs have been created. Um, as, as you and Bob mentioned, um, in the past, uh, the minimum investment threshold had been $500,000 in what they call targeted high employment areas or rural areas where the program was intended to bring a concentration of, of foreign capital uh, for economic development purposes. Um, in the past few months, um, you know, which we had been seeing the industry, you know, all of us had been waiting for this program reform for quite a few years, actually. Um, 
So the the change that happened last November, uh, as Bob mentioned, the uh, the minimum investment threshold increased from five hundred thousand to nine hundred thousand, um, which makes the decision. Uh, more expensive. So people are where we were all preparing for a lag in terms of how long it would take um, investors to scrutinize projects um, because it's a um, to take a little bit longer to recover. Ones that had been participating at the five hundred thousand dollar level for quite a few years, we're going to have quite a bit of sticker shock. While other markets that um, were relatively EV5 might still stay pretty active. Um, obviously, uh, the challenges posed by COVID have, uh, you know, augmented uh, the slowdown that we had expected to see. But I, I would say that um, over the past few months, we've seen um, uh, there's conversation now uh, discussions. Uh, Christine, I'm just going to stop. Yeah, we've, we've got a, a little bit of an echo. So, for viewers, I, I do apologize. Today, uh, we have some slight technical problems. So, let me just try and move something along here, see if it's anything from my side. Uh, internet connection seems to be really good. Um, so once again, I, I, I apologize for that. Uh, let's try and kick off again, but I, I want to move along, um, um, Christine, to one of the other big changes that came is, of course, you know, um, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, uh, and there have been, you know, major concerns about the, um, you know, the effects, the longer term effects on the economy uh, and individual investments. How can a prospective investor approach the decision about making an EB-5 investment right now, given you know the global uncertainty? Um, certainly, I think that um, we were expecting, already expecting a bit more scrutiny of projects due to the increased investment out amount already. Um, with the uncertainty and especially the timing um, of COVID-19 uh, on and the potential impacts on the economy, I think the concern because of the time involved in getting an EB-5 visa is what, if I make a decision now, how will I know those jobs will be there in two years? Um, as we've seen in the United States uh, 10 years ago, um, you know, a lot of projects struggled and, and had to be reinvested into other projects. Um, I think right now we can look at it that way or we can look at it as uh, the current environment is an unprecedented stress test on EB-5 projects. Um, right. We need to look at, do they have their capital in place? Um, has that capital been funded? Because certainly what we've seen in the past is sometimes those commitments disappear. Um, has construction started? Um, are they continuing construction um, despite lockdown limitations and restrictions? So I think the way we look at um, deals, it's not that uh, projects, you can't move forward. You just have to look at, has the financing in place scrutinized the deal? Have they decided to move forward anyway? Uh, if under in the height of, of COVID-19, they've decided to proceed anyway, it's quite strong that the project will be successful um, and, and complete. Um, that means the the everyone who's skittish has looked at it and has decided to move forward. So that's the way we look at um, decision making. It's a slightly different situation than maybe two years ago. Um, but there's certainly very strong, um, competitive, compelling EB-5 investments out there. Um, and I certainly think that EB-5 has continued um, through some of the travel bans and whatnot. It, it's kind of, uh, so far, uh, been able to carry on. So, um, you know, I think that there's actually, if you look at it that way, there's certainly um, a way to make an investment decision by asking certain sets of questions about whether that project is well underway, moving forward, is are there any barriers at this point that would stop that project? Um, a lot, you know, the the those of us operating um, have certainly looked at the deals that way, and um, you know that's why we're out there. Um, All right, okay, and it's important for our viewers to remember that EB5 is not uh, a new program; it's been around since the early 90s. So it's seen some, you know, really important changes 
uh, in how the globe, uh, how we operate uh, in, in business and in our own personal uh, lives as well. And I think, you know, probably the, the, the big major change that, you know, that came along was, you know, in 9-11, uh, uh, really, a lot of planes, you know, grounded, heightened security. Uh, and, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, that is a program that, you know, is, you know, has been around since the early 1990s. It's adapting on a constant uh, level, unlike some of the newer programs that are available in the Caribbean or in Europe that haven't yet matured uh, and are unable to you know, uh, adapt as quickly. Uh, thank you, Christine. I want to come back to you on, uh, on a couple of points you mentioned, but I'd like to bring in Noreen, um, the president of CMP. Uh, regional centers in the United States. Now, Noreen, we, we've heard about two major changes uh, that have impacted the, you know, the industry, uh, the, the new regulations effective from November and, you know, uh, SARS or uh, COVID. They've refocused uh, potential investors' uh, attention, uh, some of it to due diligence uh, and what attributes they need to be looking at when making what impacts, in your opinion, Nori, have these new regulations and COVID-19 had uh, on the types of projects that are on the market today? Uh, and I guess specifically on the projects that, you know, CMB Regional Centres uh, proposes to its client base. Yes, and thanks, Bruno, for the opportunity to um, address everyone. And I think that, you know, Bob and Christine did a really good job of highlighting, you know, when we talk about the, the regulations, um, we look at the two major impacts and how do those affect the projects on the market? You know, the first being the price increase that Bob talked about. Um, you know, demand in 2019, anyone that was considering EV5, because the regs were announced in the middle of 2019, you know, anyone that was considering it decided to likely move forward because they were getting, you know, the same result, a green card, um, for 500,000 as opposed to 900,000. And so the impact of the price increase um, is you're gonna see in general smaller raises. Um, you know, over the years, you know, the last five years, you've seen projects out on the marketplace that are hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, not always, but I think that you're not gonna be seeing these big mega projects um, because of the time it takes to raise EB-5. Um, and so, and the other, you know, aspect of the regulations is the TEA. Um, you know, TEAs were previously designated to the states and each state determined um, who is the designating authority. Um, as Bob and, and Christine talked about, there's gerrymandering. Um, you know, what happened with any regulations is um, that designating authority went back to the USCIS. And so now you're seeing a, a consistent uniform standard across states. And so what you're seeing is, you know, fewer projects, um, you know, are qualifying. And it's, as Christine mentioned, it's the true intent of Congress um, that that change of, of TEAs was done. Um, and then, you know, introduce the global pandemic, which has essentially, you know, halted capital markets, I mean, international and domestic travel has changed and, you know, life, we've all adjusted. Um, and that, in my opinion, it, it furthers the issues of the ability of, of regional centers to be raising um, EB-5 because, um, you know, investors are, are all affected, whether they're in the United States, you know, whether they're in Hong Kong, whether they're in India, um, anywhere, everyone is experiencing this. And so, um, you know, first we knew it was going to be a slower year because of the changes in the regulations, but introduce COVID, um, you know, that has, you know, for the time being, put a slowdown on, on EB-5. Um, and, you know, one of the things that the global pandemic, I think, has done is it has um, caused regional centers and also, you know, potential investors evaluating projects, you know, what type of, of project um, are on the market, you know, hospitality, everyone knows, um, has just been, you know, devastated by COVID with the lack of, you know, leisure and, and especially business travel. Um, you know, the hospitality market has been, you know, steadily impacted. And I think 
it's going to take years for the recovery. Um, and so, you know, what types of projects and what are the impacts of the regulations and COVID? Um, you know, it, it, in my opinion, I think that hospitality is going to be few and far between when you take a look at projects on the market. You know, regional centers and investors should be looking at more, you know, COVID proof, recession proof type of projects. Um, you know, it, someone might say, well, what are those? Um, yeah, well, you know, in, in the recessions, well, in recessions, you know, certain businesses flourish and, and certain businesses um, struggle more. And so, um, you know, you asked what CMB has done in terms of shifting uh, gears in terms of, you know, what we're raising on it. And we've always um, raised on, uh, with, with uh, one of our good development partners, Hillwood, on develop on logistics and uh, distribution facilities. And when you take a look at, you know, the types of companies that are, are flourishing in it, it's, it's, you know, those that are helping the supply chain, it's, it's at home delivery. Um, and you need those logistics and distribution facilities as an example. Um, with long-term leases in place, you know, that provides security for investors um, because it goes back to, as, you know, Christine mentioned, you know, job creation, you know, how are jobs created um, and making sure that, you know, the capital is, is in place is incredibly important. But then, you know, as an investor, you have a different worry um, at, at different points in your process. And so when you first invest, it's going to be, you know, how is construction going? Have jobs been created? But then after that, once they have their green card, um, they say, okay, you know, what about my return of capital? And so regional centers and investors have to be looking further down the line um, of, you know, not only, you know, what is going to be the exit, you know, a, a sale or a refinance, but how do we get there? How do we hit stabilization? Um, what sort of long-term leases are in place and what kind of sensitivity analyses have been done to make sure that the market can absorb whatever project is, is being introduced to the market today. All right, okay. Um, I want to stop you there and we'll, we'll try and come back to that because I think this is very interesting. Uh, I, I would like to bring in uh, Stephen, the Chief Executive of the Cleveland uh, International Fund uh, at this point. Uh, and I, I hope everybody can hear me crackling uh, a little bit earlier on. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Well, well enough, I think. Okay, good. So I, I know that NASA launched a rocket uh, about half an hour ago uh, from uh, Florida, so I just wondered if they had an effect on uh, the global internet connection. So next time we'll tell NASA to hold off any launches they have, sending any probes to Mars. Um, Stephen, um, Stephen International, you hear a lot uh, about you know the, the different options uh, in the very well known east and west uh, coasts of uh, of the United States. Uh, but of course, what about the other states with EB5 uh, activity? What can you tell us about the options available uh, in those um, in those centers, please? Right. Um, well, again, this is a unique program, as we've identified here. We all are involved in running regional centers. We are, you know, independent companies for the most part that are part of the, if you will, the coordinating process of this immigration program. And there are regional centers all across the country uh, that that, that uh, do projects. Um, you know, uh, as EB-5 got to be known coming out of the last recession, I think it was really when people were conscious there was a program like this where they could make an investment in a, in a project in the United States that created jobs and they could get a green card. Uh, also, a lot of the projects that got attention were one, were the big mega projects. Maureen sort of referenced that, and I agree with her comment. Maybe we can explore this a little bit more, that those large mega, mega projects that were in big coastal cities are probably not going to be the wave of wave of the future. Uh, and they were well known and they were sort of, if you will, in a lot of ways, the picture profile of EB-5. And yet below the surface there, um, Bob Kraft operates in Wisconsin. I operate in Cleveland, Ohio in the Midwest. Uh, I know CMB and, and, and Can-Am are throughout the country, but they operate regional centers in the interior. You know, the, the coastal parts of our country, the metropolitan areas are only about half of our population in the United States. A lot of economic activity 
occurs inside those two coasts in those big well-known cities. And during this last 10 years, um, EB-5 has been used. There are regional centers throughout the country like ourselves that do projects uh, throughout the country. Um, and they, they should be kept in mind, I think, as people look at uh, opportunities there. Um, I, I will make this point about, I, I think, some of the advantages of at least taking a look at you know, projects that are in the interior of the country. Um, um, starting off, first off, EB-5 is, one, one great thing about EB-5, it's very flexible. So if you want to make an investment through EB-5 and you talk to a range of regional centers, you're likely to see a lot of different kinds of projects that are being proposed, um, whether it be small business lending or healthcare, EB-5 can be used across the board. A, a lot has been done in real estate, probably the majority, and that's what we do and what a lot of those on this call do. And the, and the benefit of that is they're very easy to understand for investors. It's very easy, even if you're halfway around the globe, to understand what an apartment building is and what an office building is and so forth. And, and, and that's a lot of what we do and what I think a lot of the um, maybe less high profile big mega projects on the East Coast uh, do is we usually present projects that are very easy to understand, very easy to invest with to get their arms around and understand and assess uh, what others have said here about will this create the jobs and will it um, and, and will it return the capital to me? And and, that, uh, and so that's, you know, the, we have the phrase here, keep it simple, stupid, and EB-5 is a complicated program, but as much as you can present projects like that to folks, uh, that, that, that really gives them confidence to make this very important um, investment for them. And, and that's what we try to do. And um, I'll, I'll probably end my answer here by kind of maybe looking ahead to, to more of the conversation we have about what's happening. Um, I, I'm somewhat optimistic, it may sound ironic in, in these times, because we're actually getting presented with a lot of opportunities with very strong projects because what's going on as it did with the last recession is that banks and traditional lenders are pulling back from doing lending right now. They're preserving cash on their balance sheet. They're being cautious on, on lending. And it frankly gives EB-5 the opportunity to do what it did in the last recession and to step in and do really strong yeah. projects, play a role in that and fill a gap. Um, you know, we see opportunities like that with apartment buildings. It's an asset class, frankly, that hasn't been hit that hard uh, by COVID. People are working from home. People are paying their rents in order to stay uh, stay occupied and, and employed. So we've been presented with opportunities. And while I would generally agree on the hospitality side, because we have, you know, given what's happened, um, as in, just as an example, we've been presented with an opportunity for a hotel that would be in the middle of campus of a major public university. Uh, where it doesn't have competition. Now, I see that as a good opportunity. We will get through this crisis, and that will be an asset that, that should perform well going forward and produce the jobs for an EB-5 investor and get a return of capital. So you got to look past the crisis somewhat, too, to see the good projects. And the benefit we get during these times is a lot of the traditional sources you know, kind of hunker down and EB-5 can take a look at the fundamentals of an asset and present some really strong candidates for investors to look at to, to achieve you know, their, 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 their goal for a green card. So uh, I think that's going to happen. I, I, you know, there's going to be opportunities like that uh, for EB-5 to fill a very similar role to the last Great Recession. And um, I, I think we're going to be looking across the globe um, um, going forward for those kind of investments. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, as ever, um, there's always lots of investment business opportunities when there is um, a global recession, uh, which you know we're, we're, we're sort of partly into. Uh, there's certainly, there's a lot of business opportunity uh, in the U.S. I was talking you know, a few weeks back to some you know, uh, business consultants. There's never been a better time actually right now since the 2008 financial crisis. U.S. businesses, uh, but of course there's a lot of complexity, and the subject of due diligence uh, comes up time and time again. We see that increasingly in the U.S. Uh, and as, as we do in Europe as well. Uh, in the process, Stephen, of uh, selecting EV5 as an option for all residents, uh, how important is the regional center and what is 
the due diligence of selecting the regional centre to work with EB5. Right. Yeah, and this is, I mentioned, this is a unique immigration program in that there's this intermediary for the uh, for the, those seeking the green cards in the form of this regional star who brings you the, the project and the investment opportunity and then has to uh, manage, have oversight on it. It's a relationship we always say at the beginning of talking to investors, you're going to be dealing with each other for six, seven years potentially, depending on how long processing and so forth. So you want to be real careful. This is a business relationship that that you want to have a lot of comfort in uh, going going forward. I would say one of the good things that's happened recently um, with some of the downturn in the market is that there was this great growth of regional centers. Everybody thought they could do a regional center. It was, it's got to be pretty easy. Look at all these people taking advantage of this program. They got into the business. It got hard to do, and now they're general. A lot of folks who frankly, never raised a dime, are now out of the business. And I do think for the most part, those who are remaining in the business and EB5 are those who've been in it for a while. You have representatives, I think, on this panel that represent that experience, knowledge. They've done this for other people. They've worked with the USCIS. They know the ins and outs. And uh, so the importance, I think, you know, starts with working with one of these regional centers. You, I've always told investors, ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, ask people about their track records, ask them about their experience with previous projects. Um, and because it's going to be very important that the partner that you work with, a lot is going to be in their hands to identify the right kind of projects. Do they have the skill set to do that? Do they have a tradition and experience of doing that? And and can they, they help you along the way as, as they need to provide um, uh, information to you throughout the process that you have to file for your various applications? So the Determining uh, a good regional center with experience and knowledge and good track record, um, I, I think, is the number one and the first task of uh, individuals who are looking into EB5. And there, there are a number of them. I think it's a, I think now you have a sort of a clearer path. I mean, I, we were up to hundreds of regional centers around the country, and it was somewhat distracting because anybody can get into the business, anybody can put a website up. Um, you really want to be probing as to the experience. And at this point, those who are remaining, and, um, I will say confidently, all the people on this panel, um, you know, can, can really put forward their resume, you know, because you're hiring them in a sense to, to help you through this process. So uh, I think that part of the, where the industry stands right now is in pretty good shape uh, because that's who's remaining in this business and is weathering these times and is, um, you know, wanting to be out there seeking investors. All right, Stephen, we've had a question um, surrounding or about the executive orders and the impact on the program. I'd like to ask Noreen. Uh, before we do that, I, I want to go back to Bob and Christine. You're, um, of course, Bob, you, you are the chairman of uh, IIUSA, uh, but naturally, of course, uh, you do lots of other things uh, as a busy individual. Uh, and you're one of the first pathway uh, partners. Um, are you, as a regional centre operator, dealing with uh, any EB5 projects that are struggling uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic or any related impacts? Uh, to, uh, to the pandemic. So I'd like to put that question to, uh, to Bob and Christine. Uh, and also, what are you doing to manage your EB5 projects through this time? Um, so two questions and we'll start with Bob. Yeah, I mean, I think right now, um, you know, we are in an unprecedented time in uh, world history from an economic standpoint and uh, the uh, you know, what we're all dealing with, and not just in the EB-5 industry, but just in, in life in general, uh, none of us uh, have experienced anything like it. So there are certainly challenges that the regional centers are faced with. And IIUSA, to answer your question, uh, we've had a number of uh, webinars and discussions at the board level and with our membership with respect to how do you properly deal 
with challenges uh, in a hotel, uh, in a property that maybe uh, it has been negatively impacted and many have been by this downturn. And I, I, I think it kind of goes back to Steve touched on it, as did Noreen and Christine, that you know, uh, track record, resume, history, understanding the complexities and the requirements of EB-5, but also having a really good business team together uh, that has been around the block, so to speak, and has good partners within their project. And by partners, I mean the banks and the other funding sources, the attorneys they work with. Um, I, we'll all get through it. Uh, certainly, there are cha challenges. Uh, yes, uh, First Pathway Partners has talked to a number of other regional centers, more from an advice standpoint and uh, sharing information within the industry. That's part of the role of IIUSA make sure that we are all properly addressing issues and maybe someone on the east coast uh, has found a solution to a problem that really is being felt across the country so that's part of the educational the networking and sharing and the important underlying factors we're all committed to protecting the investors at the end of the day and that's the right thing to do and that's the only thing to do from our standpoint so uh, if you have good business partners, business experience, good track record as Steve, regardless of how tough times are. And when we came out through the uh, recession after 2008, 2009, as was stated, EB-5 was a very important part of getting this country back on its feet. <clears throat> we provided a very catalytic impact for job creations. I know in Milwaukee uh, and in Wisconsin, First Pathway Partners, began the resurgence, uh, helped begin it, of downtown Milwaukee because of money that we were able to bring in that filled a gap that was not available through traditional commercial lending sources. And we're very proud of that. Uh, as a result of that, uh, Wisconsin has grown significantly and uh, uh, it's gonna happen again with EB-5. Uh, we're, we're committed to that as an association. Uh, we sell hard in the Midwest. Uh, in California. So um, I, I think the key really is to, as Steve said, for future investors to make sure they do their homework. And there are a lot of good regional centers out there, but we did have a lot of fringe new players that were probably, uh, well, I know, uh, mostly well-intentioned, but they didn't realize how complex the business was. They saw it as easy money. It's not. It's a very, <laughs> very complicated, tough business to do properly and that created a lot of distraction uh, overseas with programs that sounded flashy but there was nothing underneath the hood so to speak to use an automotive analogy so all right. we encourage also people to dig deep and look for you know quality partners and as an industry we are sharing and we are talking about the best way to deal with challenges and cash flow shortages and different things to protect the investor Okay, thank you. So, Christine, same question for you. Um, I think that um, to both what uh, Steve and Bob talked about, uh, those of us who've been in EB5 long enough, you know, we've gone through so many ups and downs, um, not just from the last recession, but just the program changing over years, um, adjudication changes. Um, changes in the economy, changes in investor markets. So I think those of us who have been in it to that point, um, I think the ability to adapt to stay agile has been a key component. And I do think for um, who continue to operate, who continue to be businesses, a main part of their business, they have to have uh, the resilience to get through this. For our part, um, you know, certainly I think there's going to be news and there has been some news of EB-5 projects delaying repayments, deferring refinancing, I think is gonna be challenging in this environment. Um, not because necessarily the project is at issue, it's just there's not enough credit to go around. Um, I think that um, we will continue to see some of that news out there. Um, and as Bob said, you know, as an as a, as a industry community, we will, you know, try to share information and resources. Um, for our part, I think it's been about uh, over communicating with our, our projects, finding out what their specific challenges are, um, what their business plans to overcome them, um, and making sure that they meet those milestones as they go along so that we can um, then share that information with our investors. Um, I do think that 
in the past when, um, as both uh, Bob and Steve alluded to, that there was this sense that EB-5 was money available to help all kinds of deals. Um, when you look at the capital stack, you have banks, you have private equity investors, you have institutional investors. You know, I think sometimes EB-5 was kind of seen as, as money that, you know, had to come in because there were uh, investors looking for green cards. I think in this environment, all of us are very sensitive to making sure that whatever happens, that our investors have a voice at that table. Um, they don't want to be deprioritized because they're not, they don't have the resources of, of a big bank or traditional lender. Um, so I think for, for, for all of us, it's, it's making sure that as conversations happen about um, financing being deferred, payments, you know, whatever it is, um, and, you know, knock on wood, most of us, I think, have, have been, um, we look, we've done the due diligence, we've, we've really scrutinized our projects, and I don't know that we're necessarily in the... Uh, facing a lot of the, those issues, but I think we want to make sure that our investors um, really, you know, are represented within um, the the capital stacks of, of some of these complex projects and whatnot. That they're they're being taken care of, that they have a voice, and, and make sure that their original investments kind of stay on track. Um, so it has involved a lot more project monitoring and a lot more discussions. Um, and honestly, it's almost as if the original underwriting and scrutiny, scrutiny that we subjected a project to to begin with. We're kind of redoing um, to make sure that that whatever their plan to to weather this time um, makes sense, um, and that we can share that information with our investors. So. All right, we've, I'm conscious of the time where we've got um, a couple of questions to get through. Uh, I haven't forgotten Noreen, and I'd like to come back to you, Noreen, on the question of the um, executive orders and how um, they have impacted. Uh, the program. Are there any silver linings? You know, what, what's the question of uh, availability, for example? What's your perspective on um, on that, please? Yeah, there's been several executive orders over the last year. I think there's been over 10. Um, but I think it's important to highlight the most um, relevant to the EB-5. Um, and, and two come to mind, but I'll mention two other. Um, and back in January, um, this is, you know, specifically important for Nigerian investors. Um, unfortunately, Nigeria was added to the travel ban. Um, and so, you know, Nigerian investors um, cannot come over on immigrant visas. Um, you know, that sent a, a ripple um, through the, you know, community that in Nigeria. Um, you know, CMB is diversified. And so we have investors from over 100 countries. And Nigeria was a market, you know, that we focused in on. And so, um, you know, that was, that was disappointing to see. Um, and then, you know, Second came in in April when President Trump signed an executive order um, banning the entry of new immigrants. Um, initially, it was a 60 day period, um, and now it's effective till the end of the year. And the intent of that was um, he wanted to ban immigrants to preserve uh, job opportunities for US workers. He specifically excluded EB5 in that executive order. And why I mention this, and I think this is probably the, the second most important executive order um, as it pertains to EB-5 is because it demonstrates, you know, from the, the top down in our government that they recognize the merits of the EB-5 program, that it's a job creation, you know, economic stimulus program at, at no cost to U.S. taxpayers. And so having EB-5 specifically excluded there was a very good sign um, not only to regional centers, but to investors, that there is a commitment to the EB-5 program for the long haul. Um, another one I'll just kind of breeze over um, was, was in, in June. Um, there was a suspension, again, for um, U.S. non-immigrant visas like H-1, H-2, Js, and Ls, um, again, on the basis of preserving U.S. jobs. Um, that did not impact EB-5 directly. However, um, I think it's important to note because if investors are looking to come over to the United States more quickly on another um, visa option, um, it's important to know that for the time being, um, those are suspended. We, we mentioned that in our offering documents just for full transparency if they were trying to come over to the United States um, a bit sooner. And then, um, you know, in about two weeks ago, um, another one that, that sent ripples for a specific country um, was the president's executive order on the Hong Kong normalization. 
Um, mm. You know, what, what does that mean? Um, essentially what it did was the practical effects is that any Hong Kong born individuals, um, you know, that, that previously um, had their own chargeability. So they had their own um, visas set aside, you know, per country and, you know, they were current. Um, now, unfortunately, um, they are grouped into the China bucket. And so individuals from Hong Kong will now be subject to the lengthy backlog that the China um, EB-5 preference category is. So they went from current, if you're um, a natural citizen of Hong Kong, to 10 plus years likely. Um, it, it's, you know, it, with that, I think that there is going to be um, incredible litigation because this is, um, you know, has retroactive yeah. impacts of investors that have already invested. Um, you know, it's it's unfortunate, it's outrageous, um, and it's it's completely unfortunate. Um, and so I, I will see, you know, we'll see litigation on that, and I hope that, um, and I would expect that um, them to be able to prevail because of the retroactive application of that executive order. I have no doubt we'll have lots of material uh, for a future web, uh, a future broadcast, and uh, maybe perhaps if there's somebody from AILA watching us, uh, we can uh, join forces and we invite you uh, and your uh, your legal colleagues to join us on one of these broadcasts. Um, okay, um, we've got a question that's come in from uh, India, actually. It's, you know, it's a little bit, you know, latching on to, you know, what you've just been talking about, Noreen. I'd like to put this to, uh, to Stephen, firstly. Uh, how will uh, EB-5 program change uh, post-pandemic? Uh, and what impact uh, can you see uh, with regards to the elections which are looming uh, and should normally take place uh, in November, if I'm not uh, mistaken? And, and, and actually, the question is, will there be a rush from Asia in spite of you know, the, the slowdown? So there's, there's a little bit of uncertainty. What, what are your thoughts on that, Steve? Well, I think there are sort of two parts to that. One, I'll, I'll say that I, I think, uh, as I said previously, I think there's going to be opportunities for EB-5 to uh, be asked to participate in projects in really strong positions because some other financing sources are you know, being more cautious right now. Uh, we're seeing that in requests we're getting, and that's good for investors because we're, uh, it's a similar experience that we had to the last recession. We stepped in and did things that others uh, did not do, and frankly, those projects turned out well and repaid. So on that front, I think uh, we're looking ahead really mainly to 2020 at this point to a couple opportunities to put those kind of projects in front of people. Um, uh, we do have an election this November, um, I will tell you, this is my personal opinion, um, that, uh, that if, uh, if uh, Vice President Biden is elected, I think we will have a much better situation for immigration in general and for EB-5 as it goes along with that. Uh, there's a number of stated positions in terms of openness to increasing visa capacity, in terms of um, uh, uh, better uh, performance by our USCIS on processing times, and I, I think it could be a dramatically different situation for EB-5 and a number of immigration programs. Um, so um, I'm, I'm pretty, frankly, outspoken on that belief and my support for Vice President Biden, and uh, we'll, we'll see if that happens. I'm, I'm very encouraged, and obviously, if it doesn't, we'll work with the administration, and we'll try to uh, make a, a second term of the Trump administration understand the importance of EB-5. All right, uh, Christine, uh, any thoughts on the same uh, subject matter? Um, I agree with Steve. Uh, the 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 worst case scenario, EB five, um, as as both Noreen and and my colleagues have mentioned, has has always been seen as as a a economic stimulus, um, and I think that uh, certainly in the last recession we proved that. Um, I don't think there's necessarily any uh, targeted opposition by the current administration against EB-5, um, but clearly I think a lot of our prospective investors feel that immigration is a, is a not very supported right now, so there's that tension. Um, I certainly think that in, a, in a, a, a different administration, the feeling would be that there would be more support for, for immigration in general, but specifically for a program like EB-5. 
where you're expecting um, really, again, uh, job creation at no cost to, to, to taxpayers in the United States. Um, I think it's, it's always, that's why it's always kind of enjoyed bipartisan support um, in our country. Um, uh, certainly we have, you know, all speculated that there's been some slowdowns at USCIS in terms of adjudication because of uh, the overall uh, feeling towards immigration in general. We would love to see, I think, um, uh, uh, increase in, in adjudication times, which certainly is a, a big compelling factor for investors who are trying to make decisions over the next few years uh, and, and worry about how long it's going to take to gain status in the United States. Um, uh, I think that there is a lot of support uh, in this program. I think there's a lot of important companies, businesses uh, that have benefited from EB-5. So it's definitely uh, has more visibility. I think there's uh, more groups, including IAUSA, but other groups that are really pushing for EB-5 to, to uh, be successful in, 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 our, in our coming economy. Um, and I certainly think that they see ties to that too, what's going to happen with the election. So. All right. Uh, thank you, Chris. We are running out of time. Um, I want to go around each of you, starting with Bob, and uh, ask you, with all things considered, with you know, the situation right now, COVID-19, um, looking ahead, uh, what does the next 12 months potentially look like uh, for the EB5 program? In fact, I'll just give each of you just 45 seconds to answer, please. Sure. Would you like me to go first, uh, Bruno? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, um, I am bullish uh, as uh, Steve is on the, uh, the business, and regardless of what happens with the election, for the election, we're pretty optimistic as an as an organization and as an industry that legislation will be extended September 30th. We're hoping we'll get a long-term authorization, and we have worked very very hard to build a coalition within the country to support that position. And we have support from both sides of the aisle. Uh, the other uh, change we're really pushing hard for is the elimination of. Uh, derivative interpretation. So they're not included in the uh, 10,000 visa count. In an ideal world, uh, we would uh, get more visas in total because I think the program has the potential to be much, much larger if, uh, if properly uh, uh, available for the world market. Uh, that being said, regardless of the presidential election, and Steve and I differ on our views there, I'll just say that, uh, I think the country is strong. Uh, there'll be changes within the House and within the Senate who ends up controlling either side. There's always going to be a balance. And regardless of, of who's leading this country, the EB-5 program, in my opinion, will be a very important part uh, of our economic recovery. And the uh, uh, United States will remain a place that people want to immigrate to and invest in, bring their families, educate them. So. Uh, you know, we're going through some challenges, but I think we'll be just fine. I'm, I'm very optimistic, and uh, First Pathway Partners uh, shares that as a company and promotes that globally. All right. Christine, uh, final thoughts? Um, I think that, uh, to Bob's point, you know, the, the, the reform that finally took place in, in November has long, I think that whatever opposition there was as an industry, there was a lot of support for it to finally be implemented because we have other goals down the road. Um, the long-term extension of the program, so there's some more predictability, uh, addressing the visa backlog, you know, how do we deal with visas? We all understood that we had to give um, on program reform to try to, uh, I think, have uh, better odds uh, on some of the uh, policy and legislative change that we would like to see to really, you know, grow the program, give it stability, um, and for us to all move forward. So I, I would hope that we as an industry really push those items forward. Um, I think that it's important um, that we come together uh, so that, you know, the industry can um, support the U.S. economy and its recovery and, and really give interesting opportunities to our investors. Yeah, because, you know, investment migration in whatever form uh, it's presented uh, is actually a big supporter of, of you know, rebuilding economies. And it's a mean countries to attract a debt liquidity uh, in their systems. Uh, as you know, being clearly in, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, also, uh, particularly in the targeted important areas. I think I'm breaking up uh, a little bit, but I want to just finish with uh, Stephen and Noreen. Your final thoughts, please, Stephen. 
Um, yes, I'm, I'm also bullish. As I stated, we're planning on we're putting together projects that we think are very strong, uh, primarily to get into the market later this year or early next year. So I think that's very, very good. I think EB-5 uh, will be around and will be uh, available. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, to doing that. I, I uh, We are looking at, I think, a couple other things for particularly folks on this call to know. I think, uh, you know, traditionally the, the, the program has really uh, a lot of dominance by China. So I think there's a lot more outreach to other parts of the world. That's good because other parts of the world and investors who are interested in EB-5 are getting a lot more attention and they're being able to see these projects. Uh, and the point that Noreen made earlier, we're looking at smaller projects going forward, making them work economically. And I think those are more comforting uh, from an investor standpoint. They can get their arms around that. They're not hundreds of millions of dollars of projects. And um, I think those will be attractive to investors. That's the kind of uh, projects that we're looking to put in front of investors uh, throughout the world, again, uh, not, not just in single markets. Noreen, uh, some final thoughts from you, please. Yeah, absolutely. Just like my, my panelists, I'm optimistic um, about the future. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going to be, you know, smooth sailings for the next 12 months, but I'm optimistic. We already closed our first project at 900,000. We have, you know, three other really great projects on the market. We're starting to see traction again um, around the world. I think that in the next 12 months, you know, everyone's alluded to it. There's a stabilization of the EB-5 industry with regional centers that previously, you know, flew in, thought this was, you know, easy, easy money. Um, they were just going to, you know, take it for their project and move on. They weren't in it necessarily for the long haul. I think the um, change to the regulations in COVID um, has, has furthered the exit of those types of players in the EV5 industry. And I think what you're gonna see is regional centers that are in it for the long haul, that have a track record, and truly align themselves with the um, investors' goals. And as Christine and Bob and Steve all talked about, the long-term changes uh, that we all want to see, I think that we're actually going to be a lot more successful in seeing long-term you know, reform of you know, additional visas, you know, hopefully better processing times, because um, we're more aligned as a group. Because as I mentioned, it's, it's the people that are, the regional centers that are in it for the long haul, that want to take care of the investors that are going to be that fiduciary and are going to fight for them and they do this as a business this is what they do they're a regional center they're the, the intermediary and you know this is what they do and so i think it's going to be a really interesting um next year as as regional centers exit and you know my colleagues here continue to stand strong and continue to push the program forward Perfect. Okay. I think, you know, one of the messages there is that it is important for investors to do their due diligence in regional centers and really ensure that they are working uh, with well-established uh, EB-5 regional centers, uh, like um, all of our guests uh, are presenting today. We have um, run out and run a little bit over time. We've had some great questions. Uh, I would like to thank uh, each of our panelists, uh, Robert, Christine, uh, Stephen, and Noreen for joining us. If you have any further questions for any of the panelists, please do reach out to them. I know that all of you are on LinkedIn, at least. Um, if you're not on LinkedIn, uh, then send us a note to the IMC, and we will pass on uh, any messages, any questions that you have uh, for our panelists. So do contact us uh, today. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the, the audience. Uh, if you're at home, working from home, or uh, on your way to work, or finishing your day, or sitting at the office, enjoyed and found today's session uh, as interesting as I have. If you're not already a member of the IMC uh, or of IIUSA, uh, then visit our websites, iiusa.org, uh, or Got find out how you can contribute and become part of the investment migration uh, community. So lots of information uh, on our website. We'll be back uh, on Wednesday, the 5th of August, uh, same time, 2.30 Central European Summer Time. Uh, and then I'll be chatting with Professor Christine Surak, 
uh, from SAAS and University uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, Christine has been doing a lot of research on investment migration in the last uh, three and a half years. That's cultivated uh, in a lot of working papers that have been published recently into the drivers and the demand for uh, residency and citizenship by investment uh, programs. Wednesday, uh, and we'll look at the geopolitical reconfigurations that are affecting the migration market. So until then, uh, stay safe. Uh, remember to sanitize and uh, wear a mask in, uh, in enclosed uh, spaces. Uh, and we'll look for you. Um, and thank you for joining us, and we'll see you uh, very, very shortly. So thank you again to our speakers. Uh, Noreen, Christine, Stephen, uh, and Robert. Uh, we will leave you with the IMC education and training video. Thank you, Bruno. Thank, Thank you, you, Bruno. Thank you Thanks, very Bruno. much. Introducing the Certification in Investment Migration from the Investment Migration Council, the first structured learning product of its kind globally, designed for you. Explore the bite-sized learning pathway of each module on our custom online platform. You can track your progress as you go and learn at a pace that suits you, with an estimated five hours of study time per module. The Certification in Investment Migration contributes to the development of professional competencies and standards for those new to or already working in the industry. So, what are you waiting for? Visit our website to start your learning journey today.